Program Coordinator here at the Schomburg Township District Library. Uh, welcome to tonight's program. We welcome University of Illinois at Chicago Associate Professor, Dr. Malgo Jata Fidelis, to give us a historical view on the relationship between Ukraine, Russia, and Poland. Uh, before we begin and I introduce our esteemed guests, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items. First is that we have closed captioning enabled. Um, you can turn closed captions on or off with the closed caption logo, or it might be listed as live transcripts uh, in the Zoom toolbar. You can also change the size of the text in there as well. Uh, we are streaming this live on our YouTube channel right now and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel after this program ends. Uh, we plan on having it up for a long time. So if there's someone you wish to share this program with or go back and watch again, it'll be available. A uh, quick way to get to our YouTube channel is schomburglibrary.tv. Yes, TV like television. Um, that will get you right to our YouTube page. Um, secondly, I would like to talk briefly about some programs we have coming up. We have, an, uh, we have an online program, which means Zoom, on Monday, March 21st at 7 p.m. with the North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic. Uh, they will talk about tenants' rights. On Tuesday, March 29th at 7 p.m., we have a Zoom program on identifying and grow growing native plants in your garden or yard. And finally, the last program I'd like to talk about is a returning historical portrayer, Martina Matheson. She will be bringing to life infamous Hollywood costume designer, Edith Head. Um, she'll be giving us an in-person performance in a Rasmussen room at the Central Library on Thursday, March 31st at 7 p.m. Places are still available in all of these programs. So you can register by checking our events calendar or you can call our adult information desk at 847-923-3394. If you need that phone number, I will put it in the chat. Now, let's move on to tonight's presenter. Dr. Malgorzada Fidelis is Associate Professor of History at University of Illinois at Chicago, where she has taught since 2006. She teaches courses on modern European and Eastern European history, including courses on Poland, Ukraine, communism, and the post-communist period in Eastern Europe. She is author of Women, Communism, and Industrialization in Post-War Poland, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2010. Her new book, Imagining the World from Behind the Iron Curtain, Youth and the Global 60s in Poland is forthcoming from Oxford University Press in June, 2022. The presentation, Ukraine, Russia and Poland, a historical perspective, aims at exploring some of the main developments in Ukrainian history to better understand the current war in Ukraine and the Ukrainian resistance against the Russian invasion. We asked that during uh, Dr. Fidelis's presentation tonight that you put your questions in either the chat or the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of the lecture. So I would like to introduce Dr. Marco Jada Fidelis. Thank you, good evening. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I would like to say that uh, it's a great pleasure to be here um, but I wish this presentation was taking place in um, less difficult and gloomy times. On February 24th, 2022, our world changed. Russia launched a military invasion of Ukraine. We now have a war and a humanitarian catastrophe not seen in Europe since World War II. I am originally from Poland. I grew up in the 1970s and 80s in Poland. The collapse of communism in 1989 was a defining experience um, for me. So it is especially heartbreaking and shocking to watch um, uh, the attempt to restore an authoritarian imperial control by Putin's regime. As many of you may have noticed history is at the center of this war. You may have seen uh, Putin's speech 
or at least some parts of that speech uh, that he delivered on February 21st, just a few days before the invasion, he claimed to be correcting the mistakes of history. That speech was especially hard to watch for historians uh, because Putin was presenting myths and distortions rather than any evidence-based historical interpretation. What I found particularly disturbing uh, was the language of obliteration that he was using. He claimed that Ukraine is not a nation, Ukrainians are not people, they do not exist. And um, this kind of rhetoric is especially dangerous. So um, a few words about uh, my background. I have been teaching at UIC for uh, nearly 16 years. I have been in the United States for much longer, about 30 years. It's hard to believe. Um, I received both my undergraduate and graduate degrees in California. I have a BA from UC Davis and a PhD from Stanford University. My main area of expertise is Poland. However, it is impossible to study uh, the history of Poland without studying the history of Ukraine. When I think about Ukraine, I don't think about Russia. I don't think about Poland. I think about uh, the complexity and diversity of Eastern European history and the complexity and diversity of um, Ukrainian history. I also think about many other countries with which the history of Ukraine has been entangled. And again, uh, this is not only Russia, um, it's also Poland, Lithuania, Hungary, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and we could probably add a few more depending um, on the time period. So let me now go um, to some images. Uh, so the title of this presentation is Ukraine, Russia uh, and Poland to indicate the entanglements and interactions within the region. Um, it is a significant challenge to provide even a basic overview um, of Ukrainian history within one hour or so. So I will be selective in my presentation. I will highlight uh, the developments that I think um, are um, important and uh, would help us understand the present situation. The war, but also the Ukrainian effective resistance against the invasion. Uh, I hope that this presentation um, will inspire you to read more about Ukraine, and I will have some suggestions for further reading at the end of my presentation. So let's look at the map. Uh, this is the pre-2014 map of Ukraine. So let me first give you some general characteristics of the territory and the people that we are talking about and then I will move on to some of the most um, important developments in Ukrainian history with the emphasis on the nation and state formation. My focus will be on the modern era, that's the 19th and the 20th century, because this is the time when the concept of modern national identity um, that is connected to uh, a common language and culture was developed. Um, so in the 19th century, we have this new concept of the so-called nation state in Europe. The idea that every ethnic group is entitled to its own territorial borders and a political entity, the state. 
all nation states have their foundational myths, stories of origin. In Europe, um, the national narratives usually go back to the Middle Ages. So I will talk about those um, pre-modern traditions and um, how they were incorporated into a modern Ukrainian identity. One major point that I would like to make is the following. The Ukrainian historical narrative is different from the Russian one, and it's often, it, it often stands in opposition to the official Russian narrative. Now, if you are watching the news, you may have seen pictures from the city of Lviv. Lviv is located here in, um, in the western part of Ukraine, close to the border with Poland. Um, let me ask you this question. Does anyone know when Lviv became, when Lviv came under the Russian control? If you, if you know this, please write in the chat area. If you know the answer. Okay, we have one. 1945. That's a good guess. Um, it was actually in 1939, after the Nazi-Soviet pact or the Ribbentrop-Molotov pact, when um, uh, the Soviets partitioned Poland and they moved uh, into Poland, the, the Germans uh, invaded Poland from the West on September 1st, 1939, and um, uh, and the Soviets, the Soviets uh, took the eastern part of Poland. Lviv at that time was located in eastern Poland. Um, so that was in September, September 17, 1939. So um, in September, October, this part of Ukraine, Lviv and the area around it, and all of Western Ukraine uh, was incorporated by the Soviets into the Soviet um, Ukrainian Republic. So, and I am saying this because this really illustrates the complexity of Ukrainian history. We usually associate Ukraine with Russia, the Russian empire, the Soviet Union, but the Western part, Western Ukraine has a different historical trajectory. So um, Western Ukraine, um, had been part of the Austrian Empire, or Austria-Hungary, as it was called after 1867. Um, after World War II, it became part of Poland. So this is a very different history from the eastern part of Ukraine. And it shows the complexity of the historical experience of different parts of, um, of Ukraine. So let me now go to uh, some main characteristics of um, Ukrainian history, um, some main themes that I would like to focus on uh, in my presentation. So one of the main elements um, of Ukrainian history is that it has been uh, often dominated by empires or more powerful states in the region. Around the 16th century, Ukraine became an area of competition between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Grand Duchy of Moscow or Muscovy, so an early Russian state. And this story of being dominated by different empires is not unique to Ukraine. Eastern Europe is a place that um, became dominated by um, four continental empires in a gradual way, uh, starting in the 14th century with the Ottoman conquest of the Balkans and ending in the late 18th century with, um, with the partitions of Poland. In the case of Ukraine, in the 19th century, 
um, it found itself divided between two empires. One of them was the Russian Empire, and the other one that dominated the Western part of Ukraine uh, was the Austrian Empire. So Western Ukraine and the city of Lviv uh, that has been on the news so much uh, recently was part of the Austrian Empire. So uh, another important feature of Ukrainian um, society is that it's an agriculture dominated society. Uh, so people who lived in Ukraine traditionally uh, worked the land. Uh, most of the Ukrainians were peasants. They were also subjects to serve them first in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and then under the Russian empire. So um, serfdom is also part of that history. But at the same time, there is also a strong resistance against um, serfdom, uh, especially on the part of the Cossacks. Uh, the Cossacks were not serfs, they were free settlers in the Ukrainian steppe who uh, very much valued the idea of freedom, but who were also uh, militant and unruly. They were very difficult to be subjugated by others, by outsiders. I will, I will talk about the Cossacks later. Uh, it's an important part of Ukrainian uh, historical experience. So we have a tradition of rebellions and resistance against the dominant powers. Um, this was often based on social class. For example, resistance against the nobility the nobility of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth or the Russian um, nobility later on. Also resistance against Soviet leaders after the Russian Revolution. Another important um, feature of Ukraine is the tradition of self-organizing on the part of the community. We have a very effective and peaceful activism, especially in the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, to strengthen the Ukrainian community. And as you may remember, uh, they were under the domination of two empires in the 19th century, the Russian and the Austrian empire. So um, they did a lot of kind of grassroots activism from below, um, especially in terms of cultivating uh, culture and language within both the Austrian Empire and the Russian Empire. Uh, these included forming all kinds of associations, cooperatives, schools, and so on. So, we'll talk about how these main elements played um, in Ukrainian history, uh, but I also want to uh, devote some attention to the name Ukraine or Ukraina. I listed some names here that have been historically um, referred to what we today call Ukraine. So the word Ukraine derives most likely from the word Okraina, which is etymologically related to the word um, Ukrayati or Tukat. In the medieval and early modern era, the Ukrainian lands were most often referred to as Rus. Um, Rus or Ruthenia. Ruthenia is a Latinized name for Rus. After the union um, between Poland and Lithuania, the union of Lublin in uh, 1569, um, the word Ukraine became more widely used along with the word uh, Rus. In, uh, in the Austrian part, um, uh, the Austrian uh, part of Ukraine, which was called Galicia in the 19th century, uh, this was after the partitions of Poland, um, when Western Ukraine became part of the Austrian Empire. The word Ruthenia was most commonly used to refer to uh, Ukraine. During the course of the 19th century, Ukrainian national movement popularized the term Ukraine. 
And this was a return to the old Slavic uh, term, Kraina, um, which for nationally conscious Ukrainians meant our own country, our land, Kraina, Ziemlia. Uh, according to Ukrainian historians, Ukrainian territory consists of three major parts, each connected to a different form of an Ukrainian, early Ukrainian, or what they consider an early Ukrainian statehood. And that starts with the Kievian Rus, then the Principality of Galicia Volinia, and then the Cossack state. So these territories had different historical trajectories. They belonged to different states in the modern era. However, the argument of Ukrainian historians is that they all can be considered one territorial unit because of the common culture, historical experience, and ethnicity of the people who lived there. So let me start um, by talking about um, one of the major turning points of the 20th century, the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. I will be showing a lot of maps today. Uh, I would like to start the historical narrative with this one. So this is the disintegration of the Soviet Union. You can see the former Soviet Republic uh, becoming independent states. Declaring independence, um, separating themselves from Russia. Uh, one of the new states that um, emerged is also the Russian Federation, the largest state to emerge from the Soviet Union. Uh, according to Vladimir Putin, this was the, the um, uh, collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, 1991 was the greatest catastrophe geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. He said that in 2005, and he has been making similar remarks on other occasions. Uh, in March 2018, for example, he said that he would reverse the collapse of the Soviet Union if he uh, had a chance. I want to emphasize that the part um, about the Soviet Union that appeals to um, Putin is Russia as a superpower. Um, he is not a supporter of any kind of communism or uh, internationalist system, um, but rather the status of the superpower, uh, an empire. So since the beginning of Putin's rule, he was able to bring almost all of the former Soviet republics, especially in Central Asia, in this area, under his control in one way or another. Uh, you may remember the war in Georgia in 2008. Uh, in 2020, he came to the rescue of the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, when he faced um, mass protests. Um, so now Putin has Belarus um, under his control. Um, the, the Baltic states uh, are a different story. They are part of NATO and the EU. They are more difficult to reach. But all of these republics um, uh, came under, the, they, they were reabsorbed uh, in, um, in, in a way by, by Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the only country that resisted uh, Russian domination uh, in a very consistent way was Ukraine. Um, so, so, so this was this is this is really um, something that um, that um, was not accepted by Putin and his regime. Okay, so some highlights um, from Ukrainian history after 1991. 
One point that needs to be stressed here is that the emergence of all these independent states, including Ukraine, um, from the Soviet Union was accepted um, by the Russian Federation at the time. Um, all those agreements uh, were done according to international agreements in which Russia participated. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Budapest Memorandum, uh, which was um, which took place in 1994, in which Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal um, in exchange for sovereignty, for independence, um, and at that time the Russian Federation, um, uh, the Russian Federation um, signed an agreement that they would abstain from threatening Ukraine um, with from any threats against Ukraine that they would agree to uh, uh, to have an independent state. So that memorandum um, was uh, broke in 2014 or even earlier if, if one uh, looked closely. Okay, so what are some of the turning points in Ukrainian history after 1991, uh, especially the turning points that um, Putin's regime found uh, unacceptable? Well, um, in November 2004, we have a series of protests, strikes, sit-ins uh, in Ukraine, uh, and these were protests against corruption uh, and Russian interference in the election of uh, Ukrainian president. Uh, the election was most likely falsified and the Russian supported candidate Viktor Yanukovych won that election in November, 2004. As a result of protests, the original election uh, results were annulled and another election was conducted in December 2004. That election had domestic and international observers. And in the end, uh, the independent, the candidate that was independent from Russia, Viktor Yushchenko, received 52% of the vote and he became the president of Ukraine. Um, so uh, this was a blow to. Uh, to Putin's Russia, because this was not the candidate that uh, Russia supported. I have some other images. This is um, Yushchenko and his political ally, Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, you can see that the face of Yushchenko is deformed in this photo, and this is because he had been poisoned by the Russian security services. So after the Orange Revolution, things in Ukraine um, did not go well. Uh, the Russian-backed candidate, Viktor Yanukovych, came back to power. He was elected president in 2010. Um, however, his rule was, um, it quickly became unpopular, it was corrupt, um, and, um, and he very quickly uh, lost support of most of the Ukrainians. So in late 2013, we have another revolution in Ukraine, and that was the Euromaidan, or um, uh, the revolution of dignity. Uh, this had to do with President um, Yanukovych rejecting to sign an association agreement with the European Union, which had been approved by the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, instead, he was trying to bring Ukraine closer to the Eurasian economic union uh, dominated by Russia. But there were other issues, the issue of corruption, the power of the oligarchs. Um, so Yanukovych rejection of the association agreement with the EU sparked mass demonstrations in Kyiv and in other places. Um, he sent in the riot police, and as a result, more than 100 people died. 
shortly after um, Yanukovych was ousted from power, he had to flee. He went to Russia and um, asked Putin for help. Putin's reaction was brutal. Uh, he moved on to annex Crimea and start the Donbass war in Eastern Ukraine. So what we are witnessing now is the war that really started in February 2014, not in February 2022. Um, okay, so why is 1991 significant? Well, of course it's significant because of the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, but it's also significant because for the first time we have an independent Ukrainian state that is recognized by the international community. However, this is not the first time that Ukrainians created or aspired to create an independent state. So what are some of the um, antecedents? This is a map of the Kievan Rus, uh, a powerful principality that existed in this part of Eastern Europe, uh, roughly between the 10th and the 13th century. It collapsed under the Mongol invasion in, um, in the 1240s. So as you can see, this principality was, um, if we actually put the borders of that medieval principality onto uh, the present day of, um, of the European map, you can see that it encompassed parts of Ukraine, Belarus, um, and Russia mainly. So um, this is a medieval state um, and three modern states, the, sta the states that you uh, just saw on, on, um, on that uh, current map, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, they all claim cultural and political origin in the powerful Kievan principality. Uh, the Russians, however, have this uh, hierarchical concept of the East Slavic uh, people, um, they claim that they were the ones who preserved the continuity of Rus after the Mongol invasion. Um, and uh, they present the Grand Duchy of Moscow as the successor of Kievan Rus. Um, the name uh, Kievan Rus uh, was not used during this time. It was not used in the Middle Ages. Um, it was coined in the 19th century by Russian imperial historians. Um, now, when we uh, think about Rus, uh, this was, I mean, in the Middle Ages, this was called Rus, basically. Um, not to be confused with Russia, uh, Rus is different. It denotes the people and land inhabited by East Slavs. Uh, again, present day uh, Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians. So the name was coined in the 19th century uh, by Russian historians who were seeking to justify the Russian imperial expansion and especially the rule over different Slavic populations. Um, at the same time, um, also during the 19th century, and I already said that this was the 19th century was the time um, when, um, when we have this new concept, this new form of identification, uh, modern nationality. Um, so during the same time, we have a competing narrative uh, emerging from um, Ukrainian historians. Uh, one of them, one of the most prominent ones was Mikhailo Khrushchevsky. Um, and he, 
he, he is the father of the modern concept of distinct Ukrainian nation, um, distinct nation and a distinct territory. Um, he constructed his definition of Ukraine in opposition to the Russian and the Polish narratives. Um, and again, 19th century is, is really important for the formation of modern national identity in Europe and in other places. And here I want to um, emphasize how difficult it is to project our modern ways of thinking into the past. Before the 19th century, uh, the idea of the nation as we understand it now did not really exist. Most people identified themselves um, with their religion or social class. It mattered whether you were a peasant or a noble. Uh, people identified themselves with a specific place, a city or a region by the place of residence. The nation, as we understand it today, uh, the, the concept that is uh, mainly connected to a particular ethnic identity and political citizenship in a particular state, did not really exist. In the Middle Ages, states in Europe were kind of private property of the ruler or the dynasty. Uh, they didn't really care about the ethnicity or culture of the people that they um, ruled over, the people that they conquered. Um, so there was a sense of a political or cultural community, but that sense was usually limited to the elites. Uh, the elites usually uh, consisted of the nobility, the upper classes, church officials. Uh, they would have a sense of a political loyalty. And again, that loyalty was usually to, um, to the ruler or the dynasty uh, or the republic in the case of the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. So it's very difficult to talk about Kievian Rus as being either Russian or Ukrainian or Belarusian because these identities, the way we understand them now, now uh, did not really exist at the time. Uh, people who lived in Kievian Rus uh, were mostly East Slavs, but there were also other uh, tribes, uh, Fino Ugric tribes, for example. And at the same time, the dynasty that uh, founded and ruled Rus was most likely of the Scandinavian origin, the founder of the Rus principality uh, was Rurik, and he started the, the dynasty of the Ruriks. So this Rus identity um, was a project built by, uh, by the elites, mostly by church elites. Um, it's not an identity that was transmitted to the lower classes. The Rus elites chose Orthodox Christianity. Uh, Volodymyr the Great, the ruler of Rus, uh, took Christianity from the Byzantine Empire in 988, most likely. Um, so he did not take it from the Pope in Rome, but from the Eastern Roman Empire. So in Russian accounts, the Mongol invasion um, is usually considered to be the end of Kievian Rus. Uh, in the Russian national narrative, after the fall of um, Rus, the attention is usually shifted to the principality of Vladimir Suzdal um, in the north. It's right here. And then the, um, uh, the, the Grand Duchy of Moscow. Ukrainian historians, however, in contrast, point to another principality that emerged on the ruins of Kievian Rus. And uh, the, the rulers of that principality considered themselves to be, um, to be the descendants of uh, Rus. They considered their principality to be a continuation of Rus. And that's um, 
the principality of Galicia, Volinia. Um, here you have the kingdom of Ruthenia, that's another name, but uh, it, it was called Galicia, Volinia, um, when it emerged in the um, 13th century. Due to all kinds of complicated developments, um, including the end of the Rurikid dynasty in Galicia, Volinia, the principality was conquered and um, divided between two powers. One of them was the Kingdom of Poland. This is how Lviv and Western Ukraine comes under Polish domination. This happens in the 1340s. But most of the principality and most of the Rus territory comes under the domination of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. That is a new power that emerged in that part of Europe um, um, around the 14th century. And it, it began to dominate um, a large part of the uh, post-Mongol lands, the, the Rus lands. Uh, the Lithuanians are a Baltic people. Uh, they were not Christian at the time. They were um, a powerful pagan state. And because they were not Christian, they were also subject to crusades by, um, by the Teutonic Knights uh, and other orders, uh, Western European Catholic military orders that settled alongside the Baltic Sea. Um, so the Lithuanians uh, also realized they, they had this powerful state, but at the same time, they, they found themselves in this constant conflict and warfare with the Teutonic Knights. Um, so they decided to um, make an alliance with a Christian country, and that Christian country was the Kingdom of Poland. Uh, the Lithuanian and Polish elites came together and decided to form a union. So the Lithuanian Duke, Jogaila, was elected uh, the King of Poland. Uh, at this point, um, kings were elected by the nobles in Poland. This is the beginning of the elective monarchy in Poland. Uh, Jogaila was going to uh, accept Christianity um, according to the Latin rite, uh, so connected to the Pope in Rome, Catholicism, um, not uh, Orthodox Christianity. And he was going to marry um, Jadwiga, who was, um, she was uh, elected a Polish female king, uh, not queen, but king. She was a Hungarian pr princess. Um, so at this moment, Poland and Lithuania were joined by a personal union. Uh, why personal? Well, because they were connected, they were united in a way uh, by the person of the ruler. Uh, the, the king of Poland was also the Grand Duke of Lithuania. However, they, they still maintained separate institutions, administrative systems. Um, the next step in um, bringing the two states together, um, a very important step came in uh, 1569, which was a constitutional and territorial union. Um, Poland, Lithuania becomes at that time a sort of federation. Um, what is significant about this union in 1569 is also a new territorial division of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, in which Ukraine becomes part of the Kingdom of Poland. So they rearrange the division. It's a federation. It's the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. But um, the Ukrainian lands, so uh, 
the principalities of Volhynia, Bratslav, and Kiev become incorporated directly into the Polish crown. Now, you may ask, why did they do this? Why was there a need for a stronger union and especially for um, uh, bringing Ukraine under, uh, under the Polish kingdom? And uh, the answer is um, it, ha it, it, it had to do with another outside threat. So you may remember that in 1385, uh, the first union is formed because the Teutonic Knights are threatening Lithuania and Lithuanians and uh, Poles decide to get together to fight the Teutonic Knights. Now the new power that is threatening both Lithuania and Poland is the Grand Duchy of Moscow. It's a new power in the East. Um, Muscovy is rapidly expanding um, westward. And this is how we get to the Cossacks. This is a 19th century painting um, de depicts um, the Cossacks. Uh, the Cossacks lived um, in Ukraine, now in uh, 1569, incorporated into the Polish crown. Who are the Cossacks? Where the, the word Cossacks comes from Turkish. Uh, there are different groups of Cossacks, um, the Don Cossacks, the Ural Cossacks. The ones we are interested in are Zaporizhian Cossacks. They live in the southeastern part of um, Ukraine, known as Zaporizhia. Uh, the community of Cossacks uh, was formed first from um, Tatar groups, uh, but uh, they, they, there were also Turkic tribes. Um, so so it, was a, it, it, it was a very mixed um, group. The Cossack way of life was appealing to many groups in Poland and Lithuania, um, especially to peasants who wanted to escape serfdom, and also to um, nobles who got into conflict with um, with the most powerful nobles, the magnates, the aristocracy. Uh, this was a, a, a kind of area that you could run away to, to, to hide for different reasons. And at the same time, practice this um, free um, way of life. So we should think about the Cossacks as a diverse group of people of Tatar, Turkish, and Slavic background. Um, in the 16th century, Cossacks were enlisted by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to serve in the military. They were really a crucial force to defend the borders, the, the eastern borders of the Commonwealth. Um, but they felt that they were not being rewarded for that service. So um, in 1648, we have a major Cossack rebellion uh, staged against the Commonwealth, and especially the nobles. The Commonwealth is ruled by the nobles. The king does not really have much power. Um, the nobles elect the king, basically. Um, so we have a rebellion under the leadership of Bogdan Chmielnicki, um, who was first, I mean, he was first in the service of the Commonwealth, but then became alienated escaped to Zaporizhia and he organized Cossacks. Um, in Ukrainian national narrative, Khmelnytsky is considered to be an outstanding leader who successfully restored the idea of Ukrainian independence after the demise of Rus and the uh, Galician Volinian principality. Um, and indeed, Chmielnicki succeeded in bringing most of Ukrainian lands under his control and in creating um, a sort of an independent uh, Cossack state, uh, the, the hetman, he became the hetman of the Cossack state. Well, what contributed to the anger of the Cossacks and to the rebellion was also the Polish effort to convert 
Orthodox believers to Catholicism. Cossacks were Orthodox. They were indeed fiercely Orthodox. Um, however, at the end of the 16th century, we have this effort uh, related to the Catholic Reformation or Counter-Reformation um, to, to convert Orthodox to Catholicism. Uh, in 1596, um, we have the Union of Brest, uh, which basically, um, it meant that Orthodox people uh, could keep their liturgy, their rituals, uh, their, most of their teaching, but they had to accept the authority of the Pope, the Pope in Rome. So basically, um, uh, they would agree to be the subjects to the Roman Catholic Church. And this is the origin of the Unite Church or the Greek Catholic Church or the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Um, there are many Ukrainian Catholic churches in Chicago. Uh, the Union had some support of Orthodox nobles, but not all. Um, it actually resulted in um, bloody struggles between the Orthodox who rejected the Union and those who accepted it. And the Cossacks were on the side of the Orthodox. So the Khmelnytsky uprising um, has its place in literature, culture, art, and film in, uh, in Poland and Ukraine, in Russia. He's also considered to be a hero uh, in Russian historical uh, narratives. And I will, um, in a minute, this will become obvious why. Um, but what is really important about this uprising, what is interesting to us is that this uprising really changed the geopolitical configuration in this part of Europe. So Khmelnytsky wanted recognition of Soviet, of Cossack rights from the Commonwealth. He wanted the Cossacks to have um, some privilege similar to the uh, Polish and Lithuanian nobility and to have some autonomy within the Commonwealth. However, the magnates, the powerful nobles who ruled the Commonwealth at the time would have none of this. They considered Cossacks to be bandits, not worthy of the inclusion. Um, so they eventually agreed to create an independent Cossack state, but they really did not keep the agreement. Um, so what did Khmelnytsky do? Well, he decided to go to Muscovy, to the Russian Tsar, to ask for the same rights and autonomy that he could not get from the Commonwealth. And this is how we get to the Pierre Yeslav Agreement uh, in 1654, um, uh, which basically meant that um, the Hetmanet state uh, now gets protection from the Russian Tsar. The, the, the Russian Tsar is the, um, the guarantor, the protector of the autonomy of the Cossacks. And this has tremendous consequences for, um, for the configuration of power in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's a very significant step in the Russian expansion to the West. So this is the, uh, the Cossack state. Um, in 1667, um, Poland and Muscovy uh, make a deal. They divide, they partition Ukraine. They partition the, um, the Hetmanets alongside the river Dnipro here. Uh, so we have a left bank, Ukraine, that belongs to Muscovy, and we have the right bank, Ukraine, that, uh, that stays within uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. What is interesting about that particular moment um, is also that this part, the right bank, Ukraine, 
um, is referred to as Ukraine. We have this, um, the name Ukraine really appears in the Polish-Lithuanian documents. It becomes the dominant name for this part of, um, of the Cossack state. Whereas this part um, in the Russian uh, documentation starts to be called um, Little Russia, uh, Malorossia, and the people who live here uh, acquired the name uh, Little Russia. So we have this independent Cossack hetmanet under the Russian protection. Um, it lasted about 50 years. Um, then under um, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, we have a gradual uh, they, they gradually abolished the autonomy um, and basically absorbed uh, the Cossack hetmanate into the Russian empire. And it happens about the same time uh, in the 1770s as the first partition of Poland. So um, uh, in a way, the end of the Cossack state is also the end of the Commonwealth. Both found themselves um, under Russian control. Uh, Poland is partitioned by three empires, um, by Russia, Prussia, and Austria. So at that time, we can talk, um, especially as we move on to the 19th century, we can talk about two major uh, parts of Ukraine. And I made this table, um, Western and Eastern Ukraine. Um, which had significant consequences for the future. I, I do want to stress that today, this division is not as, as significant as it was at different points in uh, 19th and 20th century history, or even in the post-Soviet period. Um, but it is interesting to look uh, about how these, to, to look at how these two communities were shaped by different imperial experiences. So in Western Ukraine, the dominant language uh, remains Ukrainian. Uh, the Austrians have this, uh, they, they make all kinds of concessions to different nationalities within the empire. And um, they, they allow different national groups to maintain cultural linguistic autonomy. So Ukrainian is dominant. Um, the dominant religious affiliation is Ukrainian Catholic units and the, the political entity under which Western Ukraine um, uh, found itself is the Austrian empire, the, the part that is called Galicia. Um, Eastern Ukraine, we have mostly Russian, um, some Ukrainian, there are efforts to maintain the Ukrainian language, but the Russian empire operates in a very different way um, uh, they don't make any agreements with different nationalities. It's an autocratic empire, and they have policies of racification, especially um, starting in the late 19th century. The dominant religion is Orthodox. That's because the Russian Empire banned the uh, Greek Catholic Church, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, uh, in the 1830s. So the Greek Catholics had to reconvert to um, orthodoxy. And uh, yeah, this is the, the, the Russian empire. Um, I also have some maps. This is the, uh, the Austrian empire. You can see many different nationalities. The Ukrainians are located here in Galicia um, together with um, Poles in Galicia, in fact, the Polish nobles have the most power um, because the Austrian Empire makes a deal with the Polish nobles. So um, even though Ukrainians have some autonomy, they are still being suppressed by, um, by the Polish elites. Um, okay, so... Um, what I want to emphasize here is that Ukrainian culture flourishes mostly in Galicia, in the Austrian part, because they have more freedom to 
maintain that culture. Um, in 1848, we also have the abolition of serfdom in the Austrian Empire, and the Ukrainians benefited from that as well. They became, many of them became independent um, land holders. Now, the opportunity for Ukrainians to create their own modern state came during World War I. Um, we have several attempts to create an independent Ukrainian state. Um, the two major uh, attempts take place, one in Galicia. Right? It's, uh, the Ukrainians in Galicia um, create the West Ukrainian National Republic. Uh, the other one is in Eastern Ukraine, and it's called the Ukrainian uh, National Republic or the Ukrainian uh, People's Republic. Um, the, Ukrainians national, the Ukrainian National Republic was formed in June 1917. So this is after the February Revolution, the um, abolition of Tsardom. So this is the revolutionary time. Um, the new state, this new Ukrainian state is recognized by the provisional government of Russia. Um, after the, the November Revolution or the October Revolution in 1917, they, um, the Ukrainian um, Central Council is created. Um, and the head of that council is uh, the, the prominent Ukrainian historian that I uh, showed earlier, Mikhailo Khrushchevsky. Um, interestingly, the Ukrainian National Republic um, unlike this Western uh, Ukrainian Republic is supported by the new Polish state. So after World War I, um, we have a demise of the empires in Eastern Europe. And instead we have a creation of all these independent states. So you can see that this is uh, part of the movement Ukrainians are very much inspired by um, the collapse of the empires and the promise of the, of the great powers, especially American president Woodrow Wilson, the, the promise of self-determination, which means that um, the idea is to create all these nation states on the ruins of the Russian, Ottoman and Austrian empires. And Ukrainians want to be one of those independent states. Um, however, the international community was very resistant to that, especially uh, when it came to the Western part of Ukraine because Poland wanted to create its own state and they lobbied, um, they, they considered this part of Ukraine to be part of Poland. So they lobbied with the Western powers not to, uh, recognize independent Ukraine. Um, however, they supported the Ukrainian state in, um, in the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, we even have a military and political alliance um, between the Polish leadership and the Ukrainian leadership. Um, the president of the Ukrainian um, state at the time was Semyon Petlura. He makes this agreement with the leader of Poland, Józef Piłsudski, against the Bolsheviks. This is the time of the civil war in Russia. Um, and basically the Polish troops get go into Kiev to help Ukrainians maintain this state. However, they were pushed back by the Bolsheviks. Um, Almost all the way to Warsaw, there is a decisive battle in August 1920 at the outskirts of Warsaw when the Bolsheviks had to withdraw. Um, uh, but they almost got to Warsaw. So after that, we have a new agreement. It's a peace settlement between Poland and the Soviet Union uh, in March 1921. Um, when we have a new territorial division in this part of Europe. Um, and that is uh, 
the division of the territory, the Ukrainian territory between Poland and the Soviet Union. Uh, Ukraine, independent Ukraine, is not on that map. Poland um, took over Galicia and Volhynia, and um, most of this independent Ukrainian state in the East was taken by the Soviet Union, uh, and it was made um, into a Ukrainian uh, Soviet Republic. So this is how Ukraine became incorporated into the Soviet Union. Okay, so when we move on to the um, interwar period and World War II, um, I am not going to talk about uh, the interwar period and World War II in depth because that history, I think, can be accessed um, easier than the earlier history of Ukraine. There is a lot of literature on World War II um, and the Holocaust in Ukraine. Um, these are two books that I would like to recommend if you are interested in um, Ukraine uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, so one of them is a book by uh, historian Catherine Ciancia, uh, which is about interwar Volhynia, which was a part of Poland. And the other one is by Timothy Snyder, it's called Bloodlands, Europe between Hitler and Stalin. Uh, and it's a powerful account um, that shows how Eastern Europe and especially Ukraine became central to the Nazi and Soviet um, genocidal policies. I do want to uh, talk about two developments during the 1930s. One of them is the great Ukrainian famine um, uh, called, also known in Ukrainian as the uh, Holodomor, which took place um, in the early 1930s, 1932 to 33. And it was related to the consolidation of power by Stalin in the Soviet Union. Um, it had to do with the forced collectivization of agriculture uh, as part of restructuring um, society to uh, to, to fit the Soviet communist model. Um, and in Ukraine, however, the resistance against collectivization um, was particularly strong and it led to the um, massive requisition of grain by, by the state and also withholding food from um, Ukrainian peasants. Um, so it's estimated that at least three and a half million uh, people died during this um, famine. Um, the famine that was man-made. Uh, and and, and this, this famine was also combined with the attack uh, on Ukrainian um, communists um, by Stalin, uh, who basically suspected Ukrainians, including uh, Ukrainian communists, not to be trustworthy. Uh, to a large extent because they had created this independent state of Ukraine between 1917 and 1920. Um, the other event I wanted to talk about was the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. This is also something that is often missing from Russian accounts of 20th century history. Uh, this was a non-aggression pact signed between Hitler and Stalin in August 1939. Uh, this is a British cartoon making fun of that agreement um, because um, the agreement came as a shock to many uh, Europeans, including communists in Eastern Europe, uh, because Stalin was and, and Hitler was, were supposed to be enemies, um, but they, uh, they, they, they make this deal uh, in August 1939. What was not known at the time was that the non-aggression pact contained the so-called secret protocols not revealed to the public at the time. And uh, the protocols um, basically provided for the partition of Eastern Europe, especially Poland. 
Um, so uh, I was talking about Lviv at the beginning of this presentation. This is how Lviv and Western Ukraine comes under um, under the Soviet domination in 1939 after uh, the Germans and the Soviets invade Poland from two sides. Um, this is the map of the Ribbentrop-Molotov division of Poland. Um, after World War II, we have significant border shifts in Eastern Europe. Now, this is still World War II, um, but, but this is the shift, the shift that is taking place. Uh, Poland is being shifted to the West uh, and the former German territories become part of Poland. This part, so part of Ukraine and Belarus and Lithuania, uh, become incorporated into the Soviet Union. And of course, when you shift the borders, you also shift the population. So the Poles who, Poles who were living in those areas were encouraged or forced to move to these areas. The Germans were deported. And um, we have a lot of upheaval, um, territorial uh, and human upheaval going on uh, in this region after World War II. So um, after World War II, most Ukrainians found themselves in the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Uh, a small minority remained in Poland, in southeastern Poland, um, but that minority was also soon uh, deported um, uh, in 1947. There is a major crackdown on the Ukrainian nationalist underground that was operating in Poland and the Soviet Union. Um, and basically the Polish government deported uh, the Ruthenians who were living here to different parts of Western Poland because they were seen as supporters of that Ukrainian underground. Um, so this was the end of the Ukrainian community in Poland. Um, however, things are changing. Now we have uh, close to 2 million refugees from Ukraine crossing to Poland. Um, so I am going to stop here. I do want to say that it's easier to understand the Ukrainian resistance today um, if we look closely at Ukrainian history. Uh, we can see some tradition of cooperation with um, different neighbors and empires, Russia, Poland, Lithuania, uh, but there is also a strong tra tradition of uh, resistance against um, occupiers. Um, so this is the last slide and some suggestions for further reading. Uh, the, the books by Serhii Plochi, he's a historian of Ukraine. Um, I especially recommend two of these books, The Last Empire and The Gates of Europe. Um, Ukraine, What Everyone Needs to Know by Sergei Ekelczyk, and also a book by Marcy Shore, um, The Ukrainian Night, which is about the 2013-2014 uh, uh, Euromaidan revolution. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Fidelis. All right, um, I am going to read off some questions from the Q&A box. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in there. All right, first question from Carl. This evening on the PBS NewsHour, Senator McConnell disputed the assertions of scholars like you who maintain that Putin's moves on Ukraine were well-documented in advance and long ago. He maintained once again that Biden's Afghanistan policy green-lighted Putin. What are your thoughts on that idea? Uh, well, I didn't, I didn't hear Senator Mac, uh, McConnell um, talking about this. I, I think it's, it's well documented that uh, Putin, Putin um, uh, made his intentions clear many times. Uh, they, these uh, 
uh, intentions were interpreted in uh, different ways, but um, he made those intentions clear on many occasions. Uh, for example, I was talking about 2018 when he basically said that um, if he had a chance, he would restore the Soviet Union. And this, this came uh, during his election campaign. Um, well, the elections are not free in Russia, but let's say this was his election campaign. And um, many observers, especially Western observers, interpreted this as his election strategy, as trying to appeal to the um, older generation uh, that was nostalgic about the Soviet Union. But when you really think about it, I mean, there is really no need to appeal to particular voting blocks because uh, the Russians' elections are not free. So what he was saying, he, I think he was, he was saying what, what, he, what his plans were. And I, I mean, there are many other instances going back to even the 1990s. So, I mean, th this is well documented and it's not only in the speeches, but what happened in 2014, for example, is a clear indication that he didn't consider Ukraine to be an independent sovereign state, independent from Russia. So now Senator McConnell is wrong. <laughs> if he indeed was making that case. Our next question, uh, does Moldova have any coastal access or is it landlocked? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, it looks like a very, <laughs> very, very small coastal access for Moldova. Uh, what, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Um, is Moldova landlocked? Oh, or is does Moldova it have landlocked? coastal access? It looks like it's landlocked. I, but I'm, I'm not an expert on Moldova. I think that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question here. Um, let's see. What is the issue between the Orthodox Christian churches of Russia and Ukraine? And what is the letter of the alphabet Putin demands Ukraine give up? Oh, wow, this looks like a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know the details about any letters that, um, okay, now I'm trying to find the map of Moldova. Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. Um, what was the first part of the question? Sure. Um, where are we here? Uh, what is the issue between the Orthodox Christian churches of Russia and Ukraine? Uh, I could speak from a historical perspective. I don't know what the issue is right now, but the, historically it was an administrative issue in terms of who has the jurisdiction and the power over the Orthodox faithful uh, in Ukraine versus the Orthodox faithful in Russia? Is it, should it be the, the patriarchate in uh, Moscow or in Kyiv? And I, I really don't know how this is uh, being played right now, but I mean, there was always this effort on the part of Russia and the Russian Orthodox Church to control other Orthodox churches, especially in Ukraine. This was actually uh, in the 16th century. This was such a big issue that some Ukrainian nobles opted for the union with the Catholic Church because they didn't want to be controlled by, um, uh, by the patriarchate in Moscow, by the Orthodox Church of Moscow. So they, they wanted, they would rather have a union with Catholics and the Pope than be controlled uh, from Moscow. So it's possible that, I mean, those conflicts are still ongoing. Um, question here, were the current Ukrainian borders determined after World War II? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I have another map.
uh, Ukrainian territorial growth between 1922 and 54. So um, uh, to some extent, yes, some of the borders were determined after World War II, um, but places such as Crimea were added to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic in 1954. Mm. This was uh, something that um, the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev decided after the death of Stalin. And th there are different explanations for this, but one was that he had a special, um, he really liked Ukraine. He, he had a sp special place in his heart for Ukraine. And that's why he decided to give Crimea to the Ukrainian Republic. But at the same time, we also have to remember that at that time, he and most of the world leaders thought that the Soviet Union was going to exist for many, many centuries, that this was something permanent. So even though he was giving up Crimea, right, um, it, it was still, the intention was still to leave Crimea in the Soviet Union. So, um, but, uh, but, but this was the, the latest addition, 19, 1954. Um, speaking of that, what is Crimea's position today after the Russian invasion? It's under Russian control. It's not recognized by the international community, but um, but it's not. I mean, it's controlled by by the Russians. Hmm. Um, just a couple of more questions. Well, a few more questions here. Um, what influence or role did the German Democratic Republic have in the affairs of Poland, Ukraine, Russia during the Cold War? Uh, and I can read that again if you'd like. The, the German Democratic Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have in the affairs of Poland, Ukraine, and Russia during the Cold War. I would say that the German, uh, the, the, the East, East Germany was probably the most influential in terms of um, uh, shifting Poland to the West. I mean, it's not only East Germany, but um, but I mean, this was a security concern on the part of Stalin. Um, he wanted to put, uh, to shift Poland to the West to kind of put Germany, um, shift Germany westward, um, far away from the Soviet border. Um, in terms of politics, I mean, East Germany was uh, controlled by the Soviet Union until 1989, just as any other country in the Eastern Bloc. And, um, and, and I, I, I don't think it had much say in terms of shaping politics, but in terms of um, kind of the decisions of the Soviet leadership, uh, Germany was important in terms of um, of their ideas of security. Um, another question we have, uh, how different are the Ukrainian and Russian languages? Hmm. That's, th th that's really a matter of opinion, I would say. I mean, they are similar. They have, uh, the, the alphabets are slightly different, but mostly the, the letters are Cyrillic. Um, uh, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Russian languages are all East Slavic languages, and um, they sound similar, but they are different languages. Um, and then we have a question. What can you tell us about Transnistria? Or oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, can you point it out on a map? Is it independent? If not, under whose control is it? Uh, Transnistria. I'm trying to find a relative map. Um, a, a relevant map. Uh, let's see if this, if, if I can see this. So this is a territory that is controlled part of it at least is controlled by the Russians. There was a war in the early 1990s there 
it's not really um, marked on the map, um, but it's, um, I'm trying to find it, this, there is no good map of Transnistria, but it's a, it's a territory that is, it's, it's like a break, breakaway state controlled by the Russians. Um, And I, I think that leads into another question we have here. Is it true there are Putin sympathizers in Ukraine that want to join Russia? So uh, Ukraine underwent a significant revolution in terms or evolution in terms of attitudes towards Russia. Um, we had a large segments of the population um, after uh, Ukraine got, got independence in the 1990s, um, sympathizing with Russia, being pro-Russian, speaking Russian, identifying as Russian. Um, but those attitudes um, gradually uh, became weaker, especially as Russia was interfering in Ukrainian affairs. Um, many people would point, um, scholars would point to 2013-2014, which is the, the Donbass war and the annexation of Crimea, that this is really the turning point in which uh, a majority of the Ukrainian population turned against Russia, even those who had been identifying as Russians or Russian speakers. They may be identifying as Russians, but they don't want Putin's regime in Ukraine, basically. So at this point, I think that the country had underwent um, a tremendous change in terms of the attitudes towards Russia. And when you consider the, uh, the horrors of this war, the bombardments, the, uh, the crimes against humanity, uh, those attitudes are only going to be um, are, are, are only going to deepen and be more pronounced. I mean, one difference, uh, even between 2014 and now, is that in 2014, some of the towns, some of the local governments in Eastern U uh, Ukraine sided with the Russians. Um, in 2022, we don't have any local governments, any local officials um, taking the Russian side. They, they, all, um, they, they are all determined to defend Ukraine. You know, I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, thank you, Dr. Fidelis, for your time and uh, sharing with us your extensive knowledge on the subject. And of course, your very beautiful maps as well. <laughs> um, Thank you. And as I, as I said, I mean, I really recommend further reading uh, because it's very difficult to encapsulate this complex history of Ukraine within um, just one hour. Yes, absolutely. And we thank you for the Herculean effort. Um, I will ask Dr. Fidelis to send us a list of the books that she recommended so I could send it out to all of you. And as I've mentioned before, the recording for this will be available on YouTube. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Fidelis. Thanks to you at home for joining us. Dr. Fidelis, do you have any final words you'd like to add? Well, thank you so much for coming. This was really a pleasure, although, you know, we, we are living in <laughs> dark times. But, uh, but it's so important to um, expand our knowledge about Ukraine, about the, about the region. Um, so I'm really, um, I'm really pleased that so many of you came to this lecture and I, I encourage everyone to read and to learn more. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to say everybody good night and uh, we'll see you next time.